We adopted this gremlin into our nervous system on the basis of feeling vulnerable and seeking a protector, a substitute parent, if you will, in response to this core perception of being vulnerable. By the way, did you wonder already what would happen to your motivational mechanism if you fired the gremlin from your consciousness? Just a heads up that I will explore with you a little bit later on how, without the gremlin controlling your mind and actions, this motivational mechanism of your life shifts in a truly beautiful way. All right, so today we will start with a little bit of a theory. Just some things I wrote today as part of uh, the book I'm working on. But this is, I'm working on part two now. <clears throat> so again, brief summary, part one is about what are you? Part two is about what are you not? And part three is about why are you here? Or what's the relevance of this whole shebang, the show. So part two is about essentially it's the physics of, or you could say metaphysics, the mechanics of the gremlin, helping people see through, you know, because in part one, we introduced them to the basic nature of reality, at least to the point of awareness. I do mention the absolute um, in some sub chapters, but mainly the book guides people to become familiar with their naked thought free awareness, both throughout thought as well as throughout no thought. And then part two helps them to liberate themselves more, I wouldn't say more directly, it's in a sense less directly, but more like a surgeon seeing through the patterns and seeing through the false conflations of the true self with the little me or the gremlin. And by showing people how the mechanics, how the strategies of the gremlin operate, how the patterns operate, why they operate, what's the cause of that? Um, they should be able to free themselves more completely and uh, with greater nuance, if you will, and faster. So uh, today I wrote a few pages on the gremlin's never-ending quest for safety, which is one way in which I kind of highlight what's the motivational mechanism behind the gremlin, what's its reason for being? Why do we have this incessant thinking, strategizing, distorting, psychic entity with us all the time, basically, just lurking around within our true I am consciousness? Why is that? What's its motivation? Before I go into the safety mode um, explanation of the gremlin, I just want to give a brief sort of overview as to the hierarchy, the causative hierarchy of the gremlin. In other words, you know, if you were to trace back all the way, okay, why am I doing this? Why am I strategizing my life in this way? What's the reason for that? And then, okay, what's the reason beneath that? And then obviously, ultimately, the deepest level is source. So we'll start at source. And then there's a few levels there that I will explain. Um, which should clarify kind of how the gremlin emerged and what it's based on. So it's sort of a hierarchy. It's, you could also see it as a chronology. It's a chronological sort of story, the origin story of this false, almost like an AI program-like psychic entity that just hijacks your life, your motivations, your choices, your actions, your behavior, and so forth, which obviously we want to say goodbye to. And the clearer we see the distinction between me, not me as in Bentinho, but me as in you, the real me, the innermost sense of me, that witnessing principle, that soul beingness, and everything else that we have bought into as being us, we have conflated ourselves with, then we can free ourselves. So here's a somewhat comprehensive causative list from absolute reality to the gremlin derivative or based personality. Number one, absolute reality, source indescribable, infinity, you could say, but even that's almost too much of a description. Then 
absolute reality at some point becomes aware of itself. So second step in a way in this chronology would be universal awareness beingness. In other words, God or the universal I am. Then one step down from that you could say is the individuated consciousness, the soul, essentially the essence of an entity of a focal point of all that is, you could also identify this as your individual sense of I am or your individual I am. Then relevant to the gremlin, the fourth step would be, which doesn't apply to all dimensions and all lifetimes, but it applies to this one. There's the process of incarnation, right? So we have absolute reality with the power of awareness or intelligence, then the individuation, the expression of free agents to further its agenda, which is to express itself in infinite ways, to know itself through infinite ways. And now one of these focal points goes through the process of incarnation, at least as we know it on earth or have known it up to this point. It's changing, but there is this veil, right? So the process of incarnation where the individuated I am covers itself with the veil of forgetfulness. And that's then sort of pulled over our I am consciousness. Then what happens, this is this is a brief description in the book, I explain everything in more greater depth. But I think you guys can catch on. So then once we're born, you could say, just to sort of fast forward, we're born, we start opening our eyes, walking around, within this veil of forgetfulness, what begins to be created is a perception, not, it's not true, but it's a perception, slash, sort of an experiential interpretation of duality. Most obviously, it's caused by that physical sense of I am over here as this body, and everything else, the rest of existence is over there. So this generates a perception at a very deep level in our in our minds, that there is separation, that there is duality. Now, without that, the, the reason I'm mentioning it, it seems almost obvious, like, okay, yeah, but without this, the gremlin couldn't emerge, right? So it needs to have a sense of duality, a sense of self that is separate from other than the rest of existence. So we get born and the perception or interpretation of duality, which is very subtle, it's very abstract, but it's nevertheless very tangible and tends to embed itself quite deeply into our sense of self and sense of awareness. This sense of duality then results in the conviction and feeling that our self is separate from the whole, which is further cemented with the conviction and sense that our self or me, usually perceived to be the body at this stage, identified with the body, has an isolated limited location inside of an assumed to be objective external reality. So there's the perception of duality, I'm over here, the rest is over there, that's further cemented by identification with the body, that produces a sense of I have a location. That's different from every other location. And so now there's this obj seemingly objective external reality that appears to be outside of us, but it's really in our consciousness. And this sense of an internal reality. The next step then is now that I am a body in a location separate from the rest of existence. And all this is an illusion or a delusion because it's believed in. When an, illu an illusion is harmless, but when it's believed in, it becomes a delusion. Samsara is harmless, or you could say Maya is harmless, but Samsara is the belief in Maya, it's the suffering. So now that I'm a body in a location, or so I think and feel, separate from the rest of existence, I will automatically generate and continue to reinforce the perception or interpretation or feeling, and this one is important, that I am is vulnerable. Because if I'm over here and the rest of existence is over there, if I'm this body and not the floor and not the mountains and not the sky and not the creator, then automatically, if I think this body, this location equals the I am, 
which we can see in direct experience is not the case because we can't find I am in anything we perceive. But often we assume this and we create a feeling around this assumption that I am is the body. And as soon as I am positioning myself in duality, now I am is perceived to be vulnerable. And this is really the start of the gremlin. Once I am, or you, yourself, is believed, perceived, and felt as vulnerable, the gremlin comes into being. Vulnerability is the gremlin's primary fuel source. It's the reason we invite in, slash generate, slash develop this artificial psychic construct of a false self or substitute parent, a protector, a caretaker, which we willingly adopt, willingly adopt, we invite it in, because we believe we're unsafe, we're vulnerable, therefore we need to be kept safe, therefore we create it, we invite it in. And this can sometimes be a different entity, it can actually be a psychic thought form. It's not always as innocent as just your own mind being out of control and thinking a lot. It can actually have sort of the shape of an entity. And multiple entities can express themselves through your gremlin, can form this gremlin that you think is your own self, your personality, your name, your phone number, your email address, your behaviors, your ambitions. So it's the reason, the vulnerability belief, it's a belief, there's no evidence for it, but we believe, we think there's evidence that we're vulnerable, this is the reason we invite in this artificial psychic construct of a false self or substitute parent, which we willingly adopt and integrate into our otherwise pure consciousness in order to keep us safe. So that's without that reasoning, without I am vulnerable, therefore I need safety, there wouldn't be a gremlin. There wouldn't be that weakness in us, this susceptibility to evil, the susceptibility to distortion. Since we believe we are vulnerable, which is an illusion ultimately, we create the first function of the gremlin, a threat slash value assessment protocol. We are now using much of our mental bandwidth in being in a near constant state of assessing whether a perceived object, including people, places, activities, etc., are threatening to our safety versus which objects of perception might be valuable to acquire greater security or safety. So we're all, in other words, we're always on the lookout. This is what's costing so much energy. This is what's generating so much erroneous, non-unity oriented thinking. So this is the threat slash value assessment energy or protocol, you could say, where we're constantly assessing the threat or the value of our perceptions, of our meditations even, of our ideas, our ideologies, of other people's thoughts, physical experiences. Is this safe, yes or no? Is this gonna to lead to greater safety? Does it have value for me? If so, I'm gonna to try to acquire it. If it is threatening my safety, I'm gonna avoid it. I'm gonna blind myself to it, I'm gonna walk away. There is some practical value to this, obviously, but we've taken it way too far uh, to a point of conflation of self with the false self. So now we're at the level where we feel unsafe, we feel vulnerable, and therefore we've invited in this construct, this strategizer, this tactician, to constantly assess threat value, threat value, threat value. And this is sort of the main programming of our lives. This results in a further dualistic categorization of life, where we begin to store certain ideas or concepts, or objects of perception, or memories, in our psychological drawer of loss, and the other ideas in the drawer of gain. So, or you could say value or loss. So now we have this dualistic principle of this is good and this is bad for us. This is what we want and this is what we don't want. The psychological closet with the two drawers produces an active state of the gremlin, the tactician, or the strategist, you could say. 
The tactician's goal shapes our life, our decisions, our relationships, and our choices almost completely. Our life's energy is now harshly divided into acceptance and rejection, or acquisition and avoidance. Then, the unique ways in which each of us have come to perceive what is valuable and gains us greater safety, aka less vulnerability, versus what is likely to cause us loss of safety, and the unique way in which our psychology develops its tactical capabilities to navigate the objects of life, accepting objects of gain while rejecting objects of loss, or attempting to acquire objects of gain, of safety, while avoiding the objects of loss, creates our unique personalities to a large degree. Now, some of your soul personality can shine through, but it's rare, and it takes work for most people. The result is thus the gremlin, a.k.a. the false sense of self, a.k.a. the great distorter of our vision, of our freedom, of our true will, of our actual reason for incarnating, and of our happiness in general. Okay, now let's move on to what I wrote um, actually just before the session, a couple hours ago. The gremlin's never-ending quest for safety. And as I'm reading this, just kind of take it as a guided meditation. It's about three full pages. And see if you can detect this mechanism in yourself, because that's the most powerful. It's easy to see it in other people. It's easy to generalize it. But can you see it honestly within how it still operates within you? And can you acknowledge that with honesty? It's most powerful. The gremlin's never-ending quest for safety. We have already observed how the most fundamental motivation behind the gremlin's near-constant strategizing, in other words, thinking, this is what we perceive as our thoughts, is to protect what little safety it believes or perceives that it currently has, aka to survive, or to acquire more of that safety, to thrive. So let's conclude and summarize that the gremlin's main incentive or goal behind all of its distorting endeavors within our originally pure intelligent awareness is perceived safety. This is the main incentive or goal behind all the distorting endeavors. After all, anything our gremlin seeks to obtain, avoid, accomplish, or protect is in some way, shape, or form an offspring of this concept of perceived safety. You can examine this in much greater detail in your own life, and I encourage you to, but it will, I will name a few relatable examples which can all easily reveal that the true motivation behind them is perceived safety. For instance, fighting an attacker, someone who attacks you, fighting, physically fighting them. It's a strategy for safety. I'm not saying it's wrong. It might be appropriate, but it is a strategy for safety, perceived safety. Lying to our spouse, our partner, lying or distorting truths or telling half-truths or not being upfront or honest with things can be perfect strategy to stay safe. Perceived safety. It's not because you're destroying your soul in the process and causing a backlash of karma, so it's the opposite of safe. But in our stupid minds, we believe this is why it's perceived safety, that it's safe to do these things. And so we do these things. We let the gremlin infuse us with strategies as to why to do this. More examples. Buying a new house in a nicer neighborhood. Perceived safety. Buying a fancier car. Perceived safety. Attention, status. It can also be an expression of joy, don't get me wrong. But we're looking at the negative side of things right now. Not letting someone see our vulnerability. Avoiding relationship, but also striving for relationship. Both of these are perceived safety. Investing in a new currency that shows future promise. Safety. Creating new oil pipelines. Safety. Protesting against new oil pipelines. Safety. 
associating ourselves with those who are well respected, safety, avoiding being associated with those who have been cancelled or ridiculed by the masses, safety, being politically left wing, safety, being politically right wing, safety, defending ourselves online, safety, not defending ourselves online, safety, being on social media, safety, not being on social media, safety, starting a company, safety, not starting a company, safety, taking up a four year study, safety, not taking up that four year study, safety, etc, etc. Take any of these examples, or investigate any of your own current motivations or aspirations in life, and with a little bit of clarity, you will be able to quickly spot the deeper motivational incentive at play here. Whatever you are chasing or avoiding is done in an attempt to avoid the loss of your current level of perceived safety or to acquire more perceived safety. Again, this is the fuel for the gremlin. It's the main motivation. And I say perceived safety because what is safety truly? More on this later. I won't discuss this now, but more on this later in the book. Does the definition of what safety actually is not depend entirely on the beliefs of the beholder? Why else would starting a company and not starting a company both be motivated by the desire for safety? If we all believed safety meant the same exact things, we would all be pursuing the same things in life. The reason why the gremlins of this world want such wildly different things is entirely because the perception of what is beneficial, or in this case, what is safe, varies wildly. Hence, the gremlin's core motivational incentive cannot be said to be actual safety, for we don't know what that is, or if there even is such a thing as safety, really. Perhaps unsafety isn't real either. Again, more on this later. For now, what we can conclude is that whatever our belief system perceives to equal safety in that moment will shape the tactics of our gremlin, gremlin's unique ambitions, thoughts, choices, actions, and so forth. If what we perceive as safety changes, what we think is safe, if that changes, so will the tactics, manipulations, distortions, and strategies deployed by our gremlin. It will adjust to our perception of what's safe. Because after all, remember, we adopted this gremlin into our nervous system on the basis of feeling vulnerable and seeking a protector, a substitute parent, if you will, in response to this core perception of being vulnerable. By the way, did you wonder already what would happen to your motivational mechanism if you fired the gremlin from your consciousness? Just a heads up that I will explore with you a little bit later on how Without the gremlin controlling your mind and actions, this motivational mechanism of your life shifts in a truly beautiful way. Summary. If we change our perspective on what safety actually means, the gremlin changes its tactics and strategies according to this new definition of safety. Survival versus thrival, which means to thrive. It's not a real word, I don't think, but I'm making it into one. Two primary modes of gremlin activation. So the two primary activated gremlin states are survival mode and thrival mode. So if we picture the core motivation behind the gremlin's inspirations, inspirations, <laughs> is perceived safety, then we can picture this motivation as having a spectrum with two ends to it, a low end and a high end, or left or right, whatever you want. So instead of one thing, it's one thing, but it has two sides to it. It has a spectrum, right? Those on the perceived to be less fortunate end of the spectrum are usually fighting or flighting for survival. They strategize themselves towards and through choices and actions which they believe will protect their current perceived level of safety or which helps them avoid a further loss of safety. This is survival mode. To protect what little safety you think you have, or to be on the lookout to avoid loss of greater safety. Or further loss of safety. 
those of the perceived to be more fortunate end of the spectrum are usually fighting or flighting for thrival. They strategize themselves towards and through choices and actions which they believe will help them acquire greater safety or which helps them avoid lost opportunities to acquire greater safety. So we're running towards opportunities to acquire greater safety and we're flighting from losing these opportunities or opportunities to lose that greater safety. And so what we have discovered here are the two primary modes of the gremlin in its activated state. One mode is geared towards survival, the other is geared towards thrival. Both are a version of anxious, fear-based living, and both ends of the spectrum can express themselves in fight or flight tactics. So you see, gremlins that are aiming to survive, as well as gremlins that aim to thrive, are both very similar in their basic makeup or reason for being activated. In other words, we're all the same when it comes to what motivates us in our less than enlightened states of being. In yet other words, what motivates us all is very much the same when we're in our gremlin activated state of being, which for most people is most of the time, usually unconsciously so. Perhaps except when they are meditating, but even then, what motivates someone to meditate? When they are truly happy and overflowing for a hot minute due to a desired next level of perceived safety having been temporarily accomplished due to some action or manifestation, in that moment the gremlin is not active, it's overflowing, it's abundant, it's aligning to the qualities of the naturally enlightened state for a hot minute, but then it crashes. Or while in deep sleep, perhaps. But in most other states of mind, what drives us is essentially the same just filtered through different beliefs and dressed up in different expressions or personality distortions. By the way, I realize thrival is not an officially acknowledged word, but it should be, and I will continue to use it throughout this book. It simply means to thrive. A very simplistic but obvious and common modern day example of this distinction between being on the survival end of the spectrum versus being on the thrival end of the spectrum is the man without money or barely enough to get by each day, versus the billionaire who has more than he could ever spend. The poor man's gremlin, and obviously this translates to all topics in life, but money is a, the one I'm using in this example. Feel free to apply it to whatever your perceived situation is. Are you thriving? Are you safe? Are you abundant in that aspect of your life? Or are you lacking? Are you on the loss end? Are you more in that survival mode? The poor man's gremlin will usually attempt to inspire its host, meaning your truer I am, that witnessing consciousness within you, or soul, if you will, in the direction of sustaining, maintaining, protecting, or clinging to what little safety it perceives it currently has, or perhaps money. The poor man's gremlin attempts to guide its host, you, your gremlin attempts to guide you. This is a little devil on your shoulder voice that you think is your own personality, your name, your phone number, your messages sent to other people. None of that is you. Very little of that is authentic. More and more so because you guys have been doing this work, but you get the point. The poor man's gremlin attempts to guide its host, you, towards the protection of what little safety it currently believes it possesses by means of feeding its host, you, you're listening. You can also not listen. You can discern. But it's doing this by feeding you thoughts, concerns, reasonings, beliefs, evidence or seeming evidence, supposed evidence, ambitions, and suggested actions that are all geared towards the protection of presently perceived safety or the avoidance of more loss of safety. The rich man's gremlin will usually attempt to inspire its host in the direction of further acquisition of perceived safety. For instance, in the form of more money, enterprises, power of influence, social standing, etc. The rich man's gremlin attempts to guide its host to a state of thriving 
in safety or being abundant in safety by feeding its host thoughts, concerns, reasonings, beliefs, seeming evidence, ambitions, and suggested actions that are geared towards such acquisition of more safety or the avoidance of lost opportunities for greater safety. In summary, the poor man lives on the survival end of the spectrum of perceived safety while the rich man lives on the thrival end of the spectrum of perceived safety. But as you can see, their gremlin's primary fuel is the exact same. What motivates them both is perceived safety. In other summarizing words, the gremlin always seeks to acquire greater perceived safety and to avoid the loss thereof. That's the simple formula. To drive this dagger of self-clarity home, I strongly encourage you to witness and examine how this truth applies in your own life right now.